So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about um, some of the berry species that are cultural resources in the Northwest, and then talk about two um, invasive species issues that we're concerned about with um, with berries. And so um, I do want to acknowledge that today, this morning, I'm coming to you from Tacoma, Washington, and the traditional homelands of the Piaut tribe of Indians. And I'm really grateful um, to get to learn and explore and share what we're learning with the rest of the communities in the Northwest. Um, so, and I, I should acknowledge too that this this talk was created um, in collaboration with uh, a research scientist that works with me, um, Fig DeWitz. So Fig is here with us today and she uh, is an author on this, this presentation and pulled together some of this information for us. So thank you Fig. Um, for being here and being part of this. But, you know, we really wanted to dive into huckleberries, but they're just one genera uh, or one genus in this greater um, group. Well, it's a, I guess it's a group of species in this genus vaccinium. Um, and so there's a lot of different species. There's 15 different species in vaccinium. Um, some of them are referred to as blueberries, some are huckleberries, some are cranberries, lingonberries. You know, even though they might be blue, they may not be a blueberry because there's these black huckleberries that could be blue and things like that. So the common names can be misleading, um, but they're all typically species of this vaccine. Um, red huckleberry is one that's pretty special to us and on the coastal side of Washington. Um, is one of the most well-distributed species um, along the Pacific Northwest coast, um, up into the Cascades. It's really important because it's 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 harvested or or gathered or as a fresh food, dry food. Um, you can store it in in a few different ways in oils and things like that for um, other purposes. It's also used for fish bait. The berries look delicious, um, and it's really important for wildlife habitat. But there's also some medicinal uses. Um, some of that traditional knowledge you all may have. I. Feel like I haven't earned much of that, so um, I don't have a, a plethora of knowledge about the medicinal uses of, of some of these, but we know that they're important. So they're important, you know, as a first food. They're really important for gathering activities as well. As well, you know, there's lots of traditions where we, where um, communities may go and gather berries together. Um, I mentioned that it has some medicinal purposes. Um, you know, I think they were, one thing I read from the Pojar um, field guide was that it, it's, uh, historically you would grind it up and kind of gurgle it if you had sore throat and things like that. Uh, it's also featured in a lot of stories. Um, and so it's a, it's an important thing to conserve and keep around and continue practicing in our communities and cultures. So I'm going to jump into a couple concerns. Um, I'm not an expert on spotted wing Drosophila, but I'll share some resources and some people that are, um, and then we can um, we can just give keep this really um, as an intro. Excuse me. Um, well, I'll turn off my alarms. Okay. So, unfortunately, this insect it's a it's like a little fruit fly uh, was introduced to. US in 2008. Um, it's native to coastal Asia and Japan. Um, and it really infects a lot of different species. Um, but it, you know, it affects all soft fruits, really, um, including huckleberries. So um, what you'll see here is the damaged, you know, in this case, it's the blueberry. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about how they damage these berries. Um, so each of these, this is a male and a female, uh, spotted wing Drosophila, they have these really uh, obvious red eyes, you'll see in a couple other photos, um, but they're only like one eighth of an inch long. You, you all are probably pretty familiar with fruit flies. Um, they're, they're fairly annoying in our kitchens um, occasionally at least on the west side. Um, but spotted wing Drosophila is a little more um, concerning because it's invasive and introduced and um, can impact agriculture and natural resources as well as cultural resources like our huckleberries. Um, 
And they have these black spots on their wings and their feet, um, which is why they're called a spotted wing dysophila. And the female, this, this photo isn't the best for sharing it, but they have these like knife-like uh, ovipositors, like tails that they can use to cut through the fleshy tissue of the berries. So typically the, the female will cut into a berry, lay some eggs um, within um, a week in the best conditions, like in, in warm and wet weather, um, they, these larvae will emerge and they actually feed on the fruit, I, I believe. Um, after another one to two weeks, they emerge as adults and they can fly and infect another. So their their life cycles are pretty quick. Um, you know, in a good good conditions, they can have ten different generations in a single year. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you know that's a pretty good summary of the the concern is if we have this in a berry patch, it can proliferate throughout the entire season um, and grow. Um, and so the best ways to manage it, maybe we'll talk about it, is probably, you know, reducing the, the chance that it's actually introduced to that site. So typically it damages the fruit, the, you know, the larvae feed on the fruit, causes these brown sunken areas. Um, it also creates, you know, sometimes these these wounds that are created in the fruit also create a, an opening for other bacteria or fungi or even other flies. So one thing that's unique about the spotted wing dystrophila is that it actually harms um, healthy fruit, like like uh, perfect fruit, whereas a lot of the other fruit flies only go for wounded fruit or fruit that's um, overripe. And as you can probably tell, I'm not, you know, super familiar with this. I've learned um, enough to know that it's a concern, but I'm willing to do a lot more research. However, um, I definitely recommend you reach out to Todd Murray um, at WSU. He's at, he's with us at the, Stem, the Puyallup Research and Extension Center, um, or also Joshua Milnes. Josh just is super obsessed with these this group of organisms, um, these fruit flies, and so he is is. Um, a really awesome resource if you want to learn more about this. Um, so these are two individuals in Washington that are great resources. And Todd shared about this last year. So if you did want to go to the recordings from, from last year's webinars, um, there is one from Todd Murray about uh, the spotted wing drusophila um, and kind of what they're finding in um, some of the higher elevations in the Cascades around Skamania and the kind of Columbia Gorge, the Southern Washington area. So yeah, dive more into that topic there. I'm gonna tr transition to another issue that I am a lot more familiar with, which is this group called Phytophthora. So this is a group of microorganisms. They can grow like fungi, but they're te technically more closely related to algae than they are to fungi. And part of that is because they, they can produce swimming spores. The reason I bring this, this group up is because we know that some, um, some species can affect huckleberry and some of the other vaccinium species. And so in this case, this is a study from um, one of the groups I'm a part of in Puyallup where um, Marianne has demonstrated that Phytophthora remorum um, can affect huckleberry, red huckleberry. So it causes this leaf blight and shoot dieback. So you might see kind of a scorching of the leaves. It's it's a little different than scorching. It's more like, uh, it might look like a water droplet that kind of spreads um, and it kills the entire leaf. Um, otherwise you might see fine twigs dying and the entire, like, like you'll just see a brown, like a line where it's healthy and a line where it's unhealthy. Um, we call that a lesion on the stem where everything um, above the, the lesion is dead. So unfortunately, this is widely spread via nursery stock. And it's really um, a concern when we're, we're growing restoration nursery stock in our in our greenhouses or in our um, you know our communities. And then we take that then those native plants out into nature um, and we plant them near um, our cultural resources. They could be 
containing a Phytophthora. The reason I wanted to include this, this is the same species that um, they found, you know, capable of infecting red huckleberry. This Phytophthora morum causes the disease in Oregon and, and California called sudden oak death. Um, so they typically have, some of these species can have a broad host range and infect many different species, but red huckleberry is now one that we know um, is vulnerable to this disease. So again, um, if you see plants like this where you know stems are dying, um, you might see some wilting. Um, you might see these kind of discoloration or the dying of leaves. Um, black, like the shoot tip dieback is kind of a, a clear sign. Um, this may indicate that there's a, a disease or a phytophthora um, present in that berry patch. I mentioned that we're pretty, we're a lot more familiar with this group. We've been doing some other research looking for this group um, along red cedar that is unhealthy, as well as trying to, to determine if it's affecting some of our sword ferns. So I just wanted to highlight that we, this is kind of how we sample for Phytophthora. Um, we may collect soil and find roots, and then because it can swim, we flood the, the soil with water and we float healthy leaves on top of the water. And if the Phytophthora is in the water, it produces swimming spores that swim up and infect the leaves. Then after the leaves are infected, we cut small pieces out, we put them in petri plates and we watch what grows out. And so we've just done this with a bunch of samples from red cedar and sword fern. Uh, Joe, are you not sure if you wanted a time warning, but about three minutes left? Yeah, thank you. That's sure. super helpful, Maria. So the last three slides, um, you know, in order to reduce the spread and, and protect our, our berry patches, it's really important that if you have berries that look like they contain larvae or you know have been infected by a fruit fly, that we don't carry those berries to another location where there's un where there's healthy berries, right? Um, because that's a good way to accidentally spread um, the fruit fly. Um you know, other things you might do is just raise awareness about the issues so that other people visiting those patches um, are aware that they shouldn't bring berries between patches and things like that. Um, if you're willing, you might document or report areas where you know it is. Um, there may be opportunities to kind of study or learn or control and eradicate from certain areas so that they, this, um, this insect doesn't spread to new areas. Um, there's some suggestion that if you harvest early in the season before fruits are overripe, um, there may be a less of a chance of having um, finding berries that are impacted. So apparently, like most fruit flies, prefer fruit that is overripe or um, maybe it's potentially softer and easier to lay its eggs into. Um, you know, so do, the spider wing Drosophila is unique and it can attack a healthy looking berry, but um, but they may prefer kind of the weakened berries. You know, if, if you're really interested in control, you might consider pesticide. There's also opportunities to trap. There's trapping opportunities, um, and then possibly reducing alternative hosts. So other berries in the area could help protect. In terms of Phytophthora, Things we want to avoid doing is is moving the the restoration stock um, into areas that are sensitive. Or if we are doing that, we would just want to we might check the restoration stock, make sure it's healthy. We could have our lab test some soils, something like that. Um, you also want to you know avoid going if you see uh, huckleberries that look like this in one patch. You might want to clean your boots or your your um, your rakes or any other equipment and tools between going to another before going to another patch. Um, we also, you know, we have some support to provide boot brush stations. And so, you know, having a boot brush station at a trailhead um, that's popular for berry picking might be good so that people are bringing less soil into the site, which could contain some of these microorganisms like Phytophthora remorum. And there's a lot of resources out there about reducing the impacts and spread of Phytophthora species. And so if you do reach out to me, I can happily share those with you. 
And as we've mentioned before, we we have support from USDA to um, design with you uh, posters and signs and boot brush stations. And so don't hesitate to reach out to us if you're interested in some some information about this that we could post um, near um, near sensitive areas and near traditional berry sites or, or things like that. I also was going to mention, um, you know, we also have some funding that is available if you'd like these field guides. Um, just let me know. You can fill out this thing or email, um, and we can provide these field guides to you and your crews. Um, and the last thing I'll share is just my email. If you want to reach out, um, you've gotten a million emails from me, but it's here as well in my phone number.